Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland, and in this episode, we'll be testing and reviewing the racing wheel button plate from Martin Asher over at Asher Racing. Now, this is a carbon fiber unit on the front and the back and on the shifters itself. It has knitter buttons on it, some dials that also act as a push button, and some switches on the top and also featuring the excellent Asher Racing Carbon Fiber Magnetic Shifters. I really like these shifters so much that I've already installed them on my Sam Maxwell Mod 30 button plate. Had to do a little bit of modding, but it went on pretty good. And now I have them on that. Also in this review, we're going to be adding on this brand new Momo Mod 29 racing wheel. So, of course, well you can see it has no holes in it. So we're going to have to be drilling some holes in it so that we can get everything bolted together. And I'll go about showing how I get that done. Next, let's take a closer look at the button plate itself. So let's get started. So now we'll take a closer look at the actual pod itself, or button plate. I like to call them pods once they have the front plate and the rear plate and everything assembled. It is kind of a pod assembly. Anyway. This is some really nice carbon fiber on here. It doesn't have a, a gloss. It's more of a satin or semi-gloss finish to it. feels really good to the touch. It's sandwiching a plastic POM, which stands for polyoxymethylene, which is a, it's a long word, which is a very high standard plastic that they use in the industry. And it feels kind of like a slick Durlin, similar to a Durlin. And... Uh, I really like it. It's, it's good stuff. And we'll take a closer look at that once we get it open. So anyway, we have knitter buttons here. And these knitter buttons he's using are really have a great feel to them. They have a, a pretty strong spring, actually, from other knitters that I've used. It feels like a, a nice resistance when it pushes back up against your finger. And I got the number off of these uh, for these knitter buttons. And they're actually a number called MP, as in Papa, S. 103F. So once I did a lookup on that knitter button, I actually found some on Leo Bodner's site. And he actually says that in his site that they actually use these exact same knitters in real Formula One racing wheels, which makes sense to me because they have a great feel to them. There's really no side slop to them at all. It's just a, a nice feel to every one of these. So again, this is all top of the line, top flight bits here that's on this particular plate. We also have a dial down here and it has an aluminum knurled knob on it. Very nice stuff. Feels great to the touch even though I wear gloves. It'll still give me better grip. It's got a white indicator on it. Nothing too fancy. And it also functions as a push button. So you can actually push it down for different functions. So it's actually a three function button left and right are two functions and then you press it down it gives you another one very nice and on the top here we have these little switches that go up and down and they're coated with a rubber you can see that rubber piece on top there again a kind of a tactile tacky little bit of tackiness to that rubber which is also a, another great thing it feels really good and of course it's nothing but a switch not too complicated there you get one button press for up and one down got two of those so it's a well thought out well planned wheel plate, I think, for the smaller wheel that I'll be using this on. And the shifters, let's take a look, well, actually, before we get the shifters, look how this, uh, the USB cable is actually put in here. It's got this nice metal, looks like stainless steel almost, I can't be sure if it's just steel or stainless steel, but a very nice piece there, heavy duty. It's got one wire coming out that is a ground wire. And once we mount our hub, adapter to these three holes back here. We'll actually put the wire on the back of the adapter through one of the bolts down here, which will give us a nice ground. And of course, there has been problems in the, in the past with guys in their wheels with electronics that the ground causes weird things to happen when you do button presses or you use a paddle shifter. So that should cure that. Now, we have the, of course, excellent uh, uh, Martin Asher shifters on this. These things are rare earth magnetic shifters. So the magnets replace the spring in these shifters, which are the exact same kind of thing that you're going to see in a race car. And the reason they use magnets is because the spring has a tendency to break after a lot of use, and there's really no way to tell when that spring is going to break on you. 
So magnets take care of that. And again, very powerful rare earth magnets and very nice positive feel to it. A bit loud, not quiet like some other shifters that I've used that weren't based on magnetic technology, but that's okay unless you're using this wheel in the same room as your spouse or significant other trying to sleep, you should be okay. Now you can see the magnet on the outside of the housing here. This is attached to the outside of the housing, this magnet here. And it's held, the lever for the shifter is held in with a pin and you can see it has a little bit of a snap lock ring there. And on the other side, it's just a nice machined aluminum pin. I believe it's aluminum, it might be steel. And a magnet on each side. You have one on the housing, you have one over here on the lever itself. So if we see the lever move, you can see the magnets attached to it. Very good design, and it's a version 2 design actually of the shifters. Because I had the first shifters on my Sam Maxwell Mod 30 wheel, version 1 as I call them, and they look like this. Let me get this one. Like this. You can see they're pretty loud clickers. But the thing is, once you mount these to a wheel or, or a button plate, it really tones down that click because you have all this mass here toning down that loud click. When you have them <laughs> separate though and you're clicking them, they're pretty daggone loud. Now this design had the same thing. It had the magnet on the housing on the top, but underneath it didn't have the magnet on the back of the lever. It actually had the magnet down inside here. So you can see that. You can see it sitting in there now. And what that is, it's a hole that was milled into the actual carbon fiber plate and then the magnet was placed in the hole and epoxied in, which was a good idea, keep it from coming out. But the problem was, for my shifters anyway, and not all of them had this problem, is that the magnet actually separated. There was such strong magnetic forces on these rare earth magnets that the magnet separated and came out of its hole and stuck on the other side of the carbon fiber plate here, directly across from this magnet, of course. It's not gonna go anywhere else. It's gonna go right to the magnet. So that meant I had this situation where the magnet was no longer attached to the, the lever itself. So then the only return spring action that I had was the actual action, or rather the spring action that was on the button itself that's inside of here, the little switch. And that's not strong enough, apparently, obviously, to give you good shifts. It wasn't strong enough to push it all the way back up. You can hear it now. It's actually clicking back and forth but with a handle on it, the extra weight of a handle, and I have the big GT handles on this, it would keep it from coming back. But here it actually will come back. Anyway, so to keep that from happening anymore, that's why I designed it this way. Now we have the magnet actually attached to the lever on the back. So it can never pull through that carbon fiber, at least I hope it can't, <laughs> to ever get on that magnet again and lose your shifting. And another note here is that the customer service at Asher Racing is second to none. I sent an email out on Monday morning at sun after the Sunday night that my shifter broke or the magnet came out, didn't really break. And Friday, by Friday, here in the States from Germany, I had a package on my doorstep with the new shifters in it. So Martin is a great guy to deal with as far as any kind of warranty. And it's great to see that. So many times we put a trouble ticket in somewhere and you know it's days before we hear anything back and some companies even want video. I mean it's, it can be a real hassle dealing with some companies who make some nice sim racing gear out there and it's nice to know that Martin has such a great sense of customer service and he just takes care of it. If anything goes wrong with anything you will find that it won't be taken care of very quickly. Now Another cool thing here is that you can actually take this cord, and I found this out accidentally, and you can store it very easily on your wheel by just looping it over the front. And because we have these cool magnetic shifters, you can just take it and attach it to the magnet. And you got a nice little package. You can go hang your wheel up if you're using a different wheel, something like that. And of course, just pop it off the magnet and you're ready to go again. That's just a little side effect or side benefit, if you will of having a magnetic shifter. Anything else I want to talk about here before we pull this thing off? We're actually going to pull the cover off of this and take a look at it and see what it looks like. We'll take the back off and I'll just have to be careful about these wires here and how they're routed once we take it off. Again, 
I've already tested this this module so I know everything is working fine before I go in so if it's not working fine when I close it back up then I know I messed something up while I was in there but I don't think that's going to happen so the next segment what we'll do is we'll come back we'll have the cover off and just take a quick look inside of how this is built and I can tell you right now all this stuff is just top notch top flight uh, he does such an excellent job in the machining the little details and you'll see that in a minute once we get these once i get the cover off just the little things the little details that go he goes the extra mile on that make the difference all right so we'll get to that next okay now we have the back carbon fiber plate off to expose the internals and as you can see it's a very neat wiring job. I like the way he's using red and black everywhere. And also we can see all of the buttons and also the rotary buttons. And those are the ones up here. And we can see up front here, these are where the two toggle switches are on front. And he's using a, an interface here that uses a two pin concept to allow these two pin plugs on the shifters to plug right into the board. And I'll give you a little close up so you can see that. You can see some pins right there that I've actually taken the shifters off of. So all of these are filled. Doesn't look like there be any extra ones in there. And you can see also the USB cable in here. It's been soldered. And each one of these has been heat shrinked. Nice proper result there. And of course that goes down underneath this interface board to the actual direct connection to the Bodner board, which is what is inside of this pod and running the electronics. And I'd like to take a, just a minute here to go over some of the detail that, this is the kind of detail that separates a lot of manufactured button plates from, from the guys who really do a great job. And this is one that does a great job. And Martin's actually gone to the trouble of actually inserting metal inserts that will allow the bolt to go through them. He could have just left them plastic because this is tough stuff, it's tough industry hard plastic. Could have just left it that way, but went to all the trouble of actually putting the inserts in over here. And if you look over here, see if I can get this to focus. The inserts are actually in here also for threads. So instead of just drilling a hole in the plastic and running the screw into it, He's actually went to the trouble of machining a hole to where he could get an ins threaded insert into it. Again, it's the little details like this that I really like to see because I know the extra effort and time it, it takes to get this kind of thing set up and executed properly. And this is definitely executed properly. So there's not much else I can show you here. Uh, next segment of the video is if you guys are interested, I'm actually going to be shooting some video of me marking and drilling and countersinking holes for that Momo Mod 29 steering wheel that we're going to be used, or is going to be used to complete this custom wheel package. So the next segment will be me setting it up so I can mark holes properly. So, and that's very important, by the way, marking holes, because you don't want to mark them the wrong way on a beautiful new Momo 29 wheel. So we'll get to that next. Okay, now we're ready to start the process of marking our holes for drilling. Again, a rather crucial process because we don't want to drill the holes in the wrong place on this brand new wheel. That would be bad. That would be real bad. All right, so what I did here essentially is I lined the, the wheel up. But first, I put a couple of tabs of blue tape on the face of the plate. And you can see where I've marked it with a pencil. You can see that in the lights. And that's exactly where I want the wheel to be. And all I'm really going to do, try to keep it simple, K-I-S-S -S here, and line the wheel up with those marks. And again, take one more last look overhead straight down to make sure this is, this is what I want. And that looks right on the money. And what I'll do is I'll just keep some pressure on the center of this wheel while I actually get underneath the, pad, the pot itself or the button plate. And I'm just going to turn these over while I'm holding pressure on it and making sure nothing slides anywhere. And then as I put the wheel back down, I can keep pressure with my hand over here on top of the plate and then move my hand slowly to the side and then let it set down. And now I can keep pressure on it. I know it's where it needs to be. I know it hasn't moved. And now 
I'll be able to get my markers in here and make my marks. So I can just come back anytime I want to, apply the pressure back on the back of it, and start making my punches. Now what I'm going to be using is this. And this is a little cheapo set of punches. And you can see the tops of these. And they call them transfer punches. See that there? And this is just a cheapy Harbor Freight set of these. And these are metric, or rather not metric, but standards. I don't have a metric, but the standard will actually do. And I'm going to be using this one here, which is a 3 16 Because a 3 16 fits pretty well in here. Now it's not too loose. It's nice, but it's not so tight it won't go down. If I try the next size up, it's just a little bit too, it won't go down into the hole. So that means we'll be using this one. And all we're going to do is slide these while I'm holding it down. I'm just going to slide these, let them drop down into the hole against the steering wheel, and wrap them with a hammer on the back, not too hard. You really don't need to make a hard uh, hit on these because all I'm really doing is marking the center of the hole that I want to drill. And I'll make better marks on the wheel once I get everything taken back off. So when we come back, I'll actually get my hammer out. We'll put everything back together and make the actual marks and see what they look like. All right, now we have our hammer, so we're ready to make our marks. So what I'll do is just use my left hand to hold the plate securely against the back of the wheel. And I'll go ahead and insert, of course, the point first. I want to make sure that point goes in, not the other end. It wouldn't be doing any good. And make sure I'm pretty straight by looking down on it. And I'll just take one quick little wrap. That's all it takes. Go over to another hole. And I'll make one more on this bottom hole down here. My hand's going to be in the way because when, when I have to put it in here. And that should do it. So let's see what we got. That might be a little hard for you to see them. I'm going to try to get up here and we might be able to get the light on them. Here's one of them right here. As you can see, that's just a dent. You know, it's very hard to see. And I have another one over here. You see that? Not sure how this is going to show up. And of course, it's, uh, my bottom one's actually easier to see because it actually got some aluminum. You can see the point right there. See a little notch right there. It's kind of a disc different color. So I can see the marks anyway. So what I'm going to do is the next step would be to make our marks bigger than they are. And what I'm going to use is a center hole punch marker. And this is just a little hammer driven job that will, as you press it down, it, t it tightens up a spring, and then the spring will release at a certain point and a hammer, and it'll drive a hammer down on top of that point, which will open up the marks I already have on the wheel. So they're bigger, easier to see, and when I go to start drilling, I'll have a much better picture of where I was supposed to drill at. And just to give you an idea, well, I'll just go ahead and do it. I'll do this one first, because it's the easiest one to see. So all you got to do is press down on this and it does the job itself. Just make sure you're right on that mark where you were before. So press straight down and it makes a better mark. And you can actually do it a few times just to make sure it's getting big enough for you. So I'm going to shake a hand here. Too much coffee. All right. So this is what it, that does. See how it opens up the hole, or rather the mark, really nice. And we can do it to the other two. Just make sure you get into the center of that hole. And you can feel it when that point is in there. Couple there. And there. We have our three holes. And there they are. Now what we're going to do is we're going to get the drill press out. I've done this by hand before. But I went and bought a, a little cheapy $100, $110 drill press because there's other things that I do around the sim racing garage that I use it for. And using it for this is a good thing too because a drill press will definitely drill better than you can by hand. Plus when it comes to drilling the other side of the holes that you'll see in a minute and applying the counter sink 
hole. A drill press is really the only way to go. So when we come back, we're going to be setting this up so we actually drill these holes. Before we actually get to drilling the holes and then cutting the countersink holes in those holes, I thought I'd give you guys just a quick look of what I'm going to be using. And this is a countersink set. And of course, it cuts countersink bevels and holes. And this is a 90 degree set. You can see it right here, it says 90 degrees. Okay. So the reason it's important that it's a 90 degrees is because the bolt I just had in my hand is actually a metric bolt that I'm going to be fastening the wheel to the pod with or the button plate. And it has a 90 degree bevel on it. Now that's typical for metric bolts, 90 degrees, although there are other degrees available on bolts. I have standard bolts mostly that I use because I'm over here in the States and I have an 82 degree set just like this because most of those are going to be 82 degrees. It's just kind of a strange thing. It's just like metric and uh, standard or decimal. Uh, always got to be different for some reason. But anyway, this is a 90 degree. And I have to have a 90 degree countersink bit to cut it properly. And if you look close here, it has one flute in it. And this is the cutting edge right here. Let's see if I can get it close. And there's really not a whole lot to these things. And it actually says half inch 90 degrees on the shaft here. Let's see if you can see that. And of course, when you go to cut these things, you don't just pick up a new Momo wheel, drill a hole in it, and then go to town on it with a counter uh, sink bit. That's not uh, the way you do things. What we did was we used a piece of sacrificial metal here, this aluminum. And because I'll be using aluminum, you want to use aluminum as your test. Or you could have used steel, I suppose, but just want to make sure it cut exactly the same. So, the first one I cut was okay. Well, this was a test one over here, and it, it was kind of flattish. You can see, but I couldn't really get it as flat as I wanted it to. It was sticking up just a little bit too much. And you can see the bit that I was using was cutting. I didn't like the way it was cutting. It was actually kind of chattering in there and you can see the results of that chatter there's marks in it so then I went and got a different bit for the countersink and was able to get the proper angle all right so now we got the proper angle so it's sitting pretty flat but the problem here is if I can make it flat I'm hard, having trouble hard making it uh, flat because the hole got so big in the bottom look how big that hole is so we don't want to hold that big after we countersink. It's just flopping around. It's really not doing a very good job. So then we got the proper countersink size, which was this one. And once you put that in there, you can see how it goes in. We drill to the right depth. And you have to kind of test to do that because I don't have the specialized equipment where I can just set up a measure it, the depth it's got to be, and then set my equipment up. It's just my equipment is not that precise. Not a $110 drill press, not going to happen. So anyway, we were able to get this nice and flush the way we want it to. But now you can see there's not much play in that screw at all in the back now, just a little bit, which is okay. You don't want it super tight. So now we have the whole size that we want, and we know which bit created it. So now I'm going to get the wheel out when we drill our holes and we do cut the counter sinks in or can't the counter sink holes in it we won't be stabbing in the dark we'll know exactly what we're doing right so next what we're going to do is go ahead and get into the actual drilling of the wheel all right we got the drill press set up we've got a cover over the wheel try to keep some of the metal shavings off and as you can see here i've actually drilled one hole already and these are what i'm calling pilot holes for the bigger drill bit that i'll be drilling with later Using a pilot hole just allows that bigger bit when you come in to go straighter through the hole than if you just started with the big bit to begin with. Not only that, but I'm drilling from the back of the wheel here because that's where I had to make my marks. And I'll be going from the front of the wheel when I make my final drilling holes. So let's go ahead and start the drilling process. And this is all about getting things lined up. That's it. Once you're getting lined up on a drill press, it's uh, everything is just pretty much autopilot. All you've got to do is apply the bit to the metal. And I do that in a series 
of cuts because I don't want to just do one long cut. It tends to heat up the metal and the bit and reduces some of the cutting speed, if you will. You can see aluminum shavings come flying off of it. Don't forget your safety glasses when you do this, by the way, because a piece of this aluminum could fly up in your eye very easily. You can see we just went through, so now we're done. So what I'm going to do now is have to clean up all these metal shavings, of course, and I like to do that every time I drill a hole before I drill another one. So we'll just hit the vacuum and suck up all this metal. As you can see, the shroud's working pretty good here. It's keeping most of it off anyway. There might be a few fragments in there that I can brush off easily later on. Right, so I guess that's about it. And what we'll do is drill one more hole, and then I'm going to flip it around and come back and show me drilling the final holes. Okay, now you can see that we are back at the steering wheel. We flipped it around. I've already hit this once to get a little bevel on the pilot hole, and everything's nice and lined up. So now I'm ready to continue my cut. And when I first start the cut, I'll hit it very easy just to make sure that the bit is still cutting symmetrically all the way around the hole. And I'm happy with it. Once I'm happy with it, I'll go ahead and accelerate the cut. And it won't take much to get through this because we've already taken a lot of the metal out of the hole with our pilot hole. And you can see how easy it is to get through it. Right there, we just went through. And that's it. So now all we got to do is clean up the mess and then we'll actually cut two more holes and I'll show you what the finished holes look like. All right, we're back at the drill press and we've cut a little bit of a countersink into the hole already. It's kind of like a pilot countersink, if you will, just to see how the bit is cutting. And I'll take this off and I'll look at it and make sure it's centered. I'll look straight down on the hole and make sure this countersink bevel looks centered on the hole. And I'll put it back in, line it back up. And you can actually use the bit to help you line it back up when you put it back in so it's not that hard. Or I can move it around a little bit if the bevel is cutting more on one side than the other and I can adjust for it. And this is a bit of a tedious process. You have to take a little bit of metal off, then check it again, take some more off, check it again, and until you finally get to the proper depth so that the bolt top or the top of that flathead is sitting flush or pretty darn near flush with the front of the metal on this particular wheel. So that's what we'll do. We'll keep cutting away here and when we come back, I'll show you the results of my bevel cuts or my countersink cuts rather and see what they look like. So we'll get into that next. All right, we've got the steering wheel holes finished and they are right on where they need to be. I've already checked that. We've got the countersinks done properly and you can see they're pretty shiny aluminum right now and we're not gonna leave them like that, of course. We were able to clear the Momo logo, which is kind of nice once we have a screw in there. Looks nice and custom, very cool. Now there is, uh, again, the reason we're putting paint in these, not only because you can see these when the screw is out, but if you, even with the screw in, if you look at it, I think the lights will catch it. You can see a little bit of a silvery ring around there, you know, kind of where the light reflects around it. So anyway, what we're gonna do is get rid of that by painting those holes black. And there's always going to be some of that around these holes once you do a countersink because to allow the screw to sit flush with the surface, there's always a little bit of hole exposed there. And of course, on a factory Momo wheel with these holes cut into it and countersunk, they've already done the whole wheel at once. In other words, it's already been done when it was bare metal. We don't have that luxury here, so we'll just have to paint it. This, uh, again, on the back is nice and clean. No scratches, no disasters happen. So again, if you guys are interested in doing this kind of thing at home, I think a drill press, a cheapy drill press like the one I have, and you can actually get a good result out of it. So next what we're gonna do is come back once the wheel is painted, I'll show you that real quick once I have those holes painted. And then we'll go ahead and mount it up to our button plate and get our quick release on the back and see what we look like in a finished product. But so far, so good. I think we're on our, well on our way to a very cool looking
custom racing wheel. Right, now we've got the countersink holes painted black so it won't be able to see the shiny aluminum. And I'll show you what I did there. It's actually supposed to be a semi-gloss black, but it is paint. And paint and aluminum usually don't go very well. They just don't mix very well. That's why they anodize aluminum a lot. Paint just doesn't want to stick to aluminum. And if you do paint it, it comes off pretty easily. This has been drying for a couple of days, and I'm really just going to be putting the screws on one time. Once I get it all together, there's no reason to take it back apart again. So there's one more thing I wanted to show you guys about the button pod here. This is the small button pod made for a wheel. And again, this is a 270 millimeter Momo wheel. So the spacing on this is actually a 50 millimeter spacing on the holes, not a 70 millimeter like pretty much all the rest of the wheels I've ever had. This is the first 50 millimeter spacing I had. And to accommodate that spacing, I have a 50 millimeter adapter for my Q1R quick release. And it's very small, as you can see, compared to the big 70 millimeter. And it just fits, let's go ahead and get this cord out of the way, just fits behind on the back here underneath this rubber grommet. So the rubber grommet's very close to it. And it'll actually go on like this. And to get the holes lined up, I just have to press a little bit into that grommet. And I don't know if you can see that, but it just pushes on a little bit. But it's a nice, compact, tight fit in there. Very professional looking. Instead of a big 70 millimeter hole spacing where you got this big adapter on the back. And of course, having 50 millimeter spacing affords us the luxury of being able to get our holes drilled in this little wheel and not interfere with our nice Momo logo. So. Next, what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and bolt it all together, and I'll show you guys what it looks like once we get the wheel all together. So we'll do that next. All right. Well, it's all bolted together. What do you think? Very nice, I think, if I must say so myself. Really turned out well. The countersinks and the screws heads are gone in really nice. And we've got our quick release adapter mounted. We've got our ground wire mounted to that. Everything went on very nice. And if you remember, I actually said something about this grommet actually having a little bit of interference with this bracket. But if you look at it, it doesn't. Again, another testament to the fine precision engineering that went into making this button plate. It really feels great in the hand, as you might imagine. This is, if you never had a real racing wheel in your hand, I highly recommend you get a chance to do it because it's really nice. It really adds to the immersion and the experience when you're actually on your sim and racing. The wonderful Asher Racing paddle shifters are working great. And actually, they're not as loud as they were when it was just the button plate or pod that when I was clicking them. And of course, that's because we've got this heavy steel adapter mounted on one side and the wheel itself, which is not that heavy, mounted on the other and everything pulled tightly together. Like I said before, earlier when I was talking about the shifters, it kind of muffles the clicks a little bit. Now, they're still loud though, so I don't know if I could use them next door to where my wife was sleeping in the middle of the night and she would agree with that. <laughs> but that's okay, they feel great. The buttons feel great, the position on the hand feels good. I guess I really think we can call this a result. So, of course, what we have to do now is mount it to the Bodner Sim Steering version 1 force feedback wheel and give this wheel a proper thrashing. So we'll do that next. All right, we're at Road America in the C7 DP or Daytona Prototype Corvette. And I'm going to use the buttons on the wheels. And one thing I noticed about this wheel with the, the top cut down like that and flat, that you can see the dash. And I thought that might bug me a bit because I'm used to having all the flashing pretty lights on my steering wheel, my GT wheel, and of course on the other Sam Maxwell custom wheel I have, it's on a C27, a Mod 27C actually. 
but it really didn't bother me because I can see the dash in my Daytona prototypes and the open wheel cars right in front of me anyway. So it's, it, like I said, it's more of a natural thing to be looking at the dash, I think. Although I do like the lights too, don't get me wrong. Uh, I don't take all of my lights away. But for this small wheel and this kind of cars, I think it actually just fits. Uh, it didn't bother me. So I really love this button plate. All the buttons are very tactile feeling. They're, they have good spring return on the knitter buttons. The knobs work. I'm, I'm using the little switch there. Just look at it. It's just instant. Never skips. Never makes any mistakes. I've had buttons and switches and rocker switches and dials on other wheels that when I would turn them too fast they would skip around or not do what I wanted them to or they wouldn't do the input and catch it on the next notch or something. So you had to kind of play with it to get the setting that you wanted, but not these. These dials, just as soon as you turn them, it's like instant, just like you saw on that switch. Everything on this button plate works like a dream. And of course, that goes without saying for these fantastic Asher Racing shifters. And again, like I said before, and you saw in the beginning of the video, I actually installed these on my Sam Maxwell Custom GT wheel because I liked them so much. Well, not really much else to see here because me pushing buttons and sh using the shifters is about all you're going to be seeing. So what we'll do next is go ahead and get to the final thoughts section and we'll talk a little bit about what I think about the overall package here of the Martin Asher button plate. Final thoughts on the Asher Racing button plate. Martin Asher has done a great job with this button plate. The quality of the parts from the knitter buttons to the knurled aluminum knobs is just second to none. Even the carbon fiber used is the best I've seen to date on any button plate. The quality and feel of the Asher shifters just adds to what I consider to be the best button plate assembly I've ever tested. I like the shifters so much that I actually fabricated some little aluminum L brackets so that I could retrofit them to my Sam Maxwell custom GT wheel and they work really well. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the cons. Well, as with any high-end sim racing hardware out there that's up to the race car standards, this button plate is not cheap. Current dollar to euro conversion rates put it at $600 delivered for my particular assembly. Another con could be that there's only buttons and shifters. Uh, some prefer LED indicators and LCD screens on a race wheel. Personally, I really like LEDs and flashing lights on a racing wheel. But after using this setup on an open wheel cars and Daytona prototypes, I really didn't miss the LEDs and LCD panel like I thought I would. Maybe it's because the Mod 29 wheel is only 220 millimeters high from, from rim to rim here. So it's easy to see the on-screen car dashes that you see when you're driving the cars. We already covered the pros of the button plate at the beginning of the final thoughts. It's really just a superb unit constructed with care and precision, covering even the smallest details, such as the threaded inserts used at the front and back plate's mounting points. It's really a great feeling unit when held in your hands, and really driving with this button plate will never cause you to have any regret for spending the money for it. Well, that's it for now. I'm Barry Rowland. And thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel.